Body shot. Ooh, that hurt, didn't it? When adrenaline starts pumping and you know what you can do with this right hand, it's hard to not do that. Here are your hosts, Derek G and AJ. Aspen Ladd returns just two weeks after failing to meet the women's bantamweight limit in a matchup against Macy Chasson to face Norma Dumont. This is a featherweight debut for Aspen Ladd. Let's see if she can make up for the weight miss. And if you want to hear something even crazier, folks, Lupi Godinez, Lupita Godinez is stepping in on seven days notice to uh, face off against a very dangerous competitor in Luana Carolina, but she's stepping in for Sajar Eubanks, who uh, is out due to COVID-19. But folks, she just came off of a big win seven days ago against Silvana uh, Gomez Juarez, first round armbar. It was crazy. My name is Derek G. I am your host checking in with the New Mexico native, the Santa Fe bomber himself, AJ Guillen. AJ, what's happening, brother? How are you living, big dog? Ooh, I'm doing good over here, Derek, man. It's raining out here in Austin, so it's a good okay. reprieve from all that heat. I was able to check out some of the... Uh, you know, the land about in my little area, I was able to get a little exploring going, ACL Fest ended, so all those yuppies finally got their ass out of Texas. Yeah, there we it's go. good to see you, man. How you living? I'm living good, man. Like I said, we uh, all that stuff that I just talked about on the intro, man, has got me hyped up, ready to record this episode. You see, I got the beanie on, man. It's a little colder out here, so it's beanie season again. We back, brother. I don't know if you remember, but when we started doing this program, when we were both in Portland or all that good stuff, or one of us, you know, back when it was based in Portland, when I was over there, I had the beanie on all the time because it was cold as hell when I was recording, man. So we back at it. A little throwback, a little nostalgia. But folks, man, we both living good. We got UFC action. We got Bellator, I believe. Uh, what do we got? 268 coming up. Vadim Nemkov versus Julius Anglicus. Ryan Bader versus Corey Anderson. And Benson Henderson versus Brett Primus are some big uh, heavy, notable matchups that people need to be tuning in for. So this is a big week for MMA, but uh, AJ, let's be honest here. I need to ask you this. I brought this up on the podcast before, and it needs to be said again. Aspen Ladd versus Norma Dumont headlining UFC Vegas 40. I respect it. Good competitors, good competition. We're UFC hardcore fans here, man, so we like it. However, do you think the UFC may benefit from maybe hosting two events a month? as opposed to one every single week. I remember, I'm old enough to remember, AJ, I think we both are, when the UFC was not doing them every single week. I think post-COVID, this just started happening. It was every single week, but there was times where it's like, oh damn, ain't gonna be UFC for two weeks, ain't gonna be UFC for three weeks, you know? But they had these stacked 15 fight cards, all bangers across the board. So what do you think? Do you think they'd benefit just a little bit from having uh, you know, two events every month as opposed to every single week? I don't know, man. That's the uh, that's the old quality versus quantity argument yeah. going forward. Do we want a constant flow of just mediocre people watching? For the hardcore fans, we're satisfied all the time. I mean, there's sure. some there's some bangers on this one. It's a little bit more of a sleeper card and definitely a, a little bit more of a sleeper headliner. But I mean, there's there's times I, I'm I'm with you. I remember when they would go even once a month. It's pay per view yeah. only, and every single fight on there was KO submissions <laughs> and absolute bangers. I would think uh, I would think yeah, man. I, I do think they would benefit fit a little bit from maybe pulling back a little bit but highlighting their real talent because yeah. uh we were saying before on the you know before the show started the uh their depth of lineup in the ufc is definitely there the fact that they're able to get it done with this many shows a week or i mean this many fights each month going on each week um but it seems like their depth of roster is nice but their depth of star power seems to be a little lacking at least this way maybe they may be able to get some some more uh, more star power going with how much they're putting it out there what do you think no i agree with you man listen i'm not opposed to either one of them i like that every single week because they got to have something right there but then again if you're a real true hardcore mma fan there's plenty of mma bouts that you can go and watch from various different promotions however let's be honest man the production quality the the like you said the star power the depth of talent right there on the rosters is much different from when you're watching the prelims of a bellator card which sometimes feels like you're watching amateur fights as opposed to the prelims on a ufc card where it's like okay these dudes could be you know what i mean on a main card right there themselves and we're going to talk about one fight that is on the main card that was my sleeper just what a couple weeks ago Manon Fioro versus uh uh Myra Bueno Silva right I mean come on dog that was a sleeper prelim match that is now the uh fourth fight on the main card so all that stuff aside man that's for the fans of the fight game to decide for themselves man it's for the people who are tuning in on ESPN every single week to decide uh whether you want to keep watching every week or you want to go you know let the UFC know how you're feeling but 
Before you do any of that stuff, let us know how you're feeling, folks, about our program. So drop a like, subscribe. You already know what time it is. Really, the best thing you can do to help us boost up the algorithms is you can go and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Type in Free Thinkers Club on YouTube or Bloody Water Podcast. Either one will take you to the videos that we post every single week. Mondays and Fridays, videos drop in 8 a.m. short clips at noon on Mondays and Fridays. So you already know how we get down, folks. This is each and every single week. AJ, me and you both went three and two a pop, or I guess three and one, really, because there are I believe there was like a no contest or something weird that happened there, right? But uh, no, actually, maybe that was two weeks ago. Three and two a pop, I believe, is, is uh, where we left off last week. So that means that this week counts big, man. The winner of this week is going to have some real traction. I mean, if you look at it, AJ, you have stormed back. I needed to just say this. You have stormed back into the uh, almost back to the 500 category. 93 and 96 are you. At one point, I think you were minus 20 in terms of under 500. Talk about a comeback, man. I'd love to see it. For myself... 110, 79, that's all right. We're doing okay, but I'm still, I'm, I'm stuck in limbo. I'm struggling to get a little bit higher, man. But what's important, AJ, is that we're killing it, that we're not sitting here. You know, there's a lot of people right now who are minus 40, minus 50 in their picks and whatnot, you know, but not us because we put in the work, we grind film, and you already know what time it is, AJ. But uh, before we move on, Listen, you see a, a poster in the corner of our screen right here, AJ. It's poster review time, but I got a little surprise behind it. So I'm going to bring this one up first, man. Um, so AJ... We got to give this a score between one to 10. This is actually not bad of a poster, man. I like the hues, orange hues. You got the interesting fonts going on for Aspen Ladd and Norma Dumont. I'm not going to lie, Aspen Ladd, if you look at her, she looks a little amused and not the meanest face off I've seen in my life. But give me your score. One to ten, AJ. What yeah, do you think? I I agree with you, Derek. She's kind of looking a little a little excited. Although a happy smile in the <laughs> ring is never a bad thing. Until the you know better better close your mouth <laughs> before you get popped in the mouth like uh, Big Bear Brown Bear a couple yep. weeks ago. But uh, no, man, this I like this orange hue going. It's almost like reflecting on them. I like this a lot. I really like the. Uh, the uh, the uh, font they got going on but you know me Derek nothing's a 10 over here man I'm, I'm going with a seven on this one I okay. like it but it's not the 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 craziest one I see and the only real like critique I have for it I didn't even notice that Aspen was above lad on this one man I thought they just had lad only mm -hmm. and then Norma Dumont you know so that maybe and that might just be because I'm colorblind I didn't see it at all so <laughs> No, I'm with you. Okay, so we're going to drop that down as a seven for my man, AJ. You know what, folks? I'm feeling a little harsh, too, today. You know, I feel like you got to impress. And right now, I don't think you could save the day on your poster with just color alone. You have to be creative. This isn't the most creative thing. This is kind of uh, rinse, wash, repeat. And AJ, like I said, I got a surprise. I'm going to show you another poster here in a second, which is why I'm so down on these posters sometimes, because there's other promotions where their posters are so creative, so amazing. So for this uh, poster right here for UFC Vegas 40, I think I'm going to go six on this one, man. I like it. I like the colors. I like the scheme, but it's a little plain behind that. So I'm going to jot those down, make sure I got that in the record book. And I'm going to take this down, AJ, and I'm going to show you the poster for Ryzen 32. Now, check this out, my man. This is what a creative, nice-looking poster um, this is what it looks like, man. Look at that. So you got the flower decorations. You see, you got the the fighters, you know, doing different poses and all these and the different squares and the different, uh, how would you say, uh, the framing of the poster and all that, man. This, to me goes to show how the Asian promotions, especially Ryzen specifically, man, they're so creative and they're willing to step outside of the box and take risks with their uh, with their posters, man. Tell me what you think of this and what would you rate this one to 10? It doesn't count, but what would you rate it? Yeah, I actually like this one a lot. It's some, some would say it's a little bit too hodgepodge. You know, you, I feel like some you might be able to get away with this. But uh, but I actually like it, man. You got that dude screaming up top. It's something unconventional that we're not used to seeing. We it's, it, This is, it's, you know, I don't want this to come off any wrong way, but this is very Asian, man. And I yeah, like yeah. that about this. I really like it about this. They're sticking to their, you know, their style, man. I would uh, I would honestly give this about an eight. Maybe even a nine. I like this one a lot, especially for the creative aspect. It's going forward. They're not, you know, sticking to the cookie cutter ways. You know, they're actually, you know, pressing the issue. I like it a lot. Absolutely. And AJ, this isn't even like the status quo for the Ryzen posters, man. Because sometimes they don't even showcase the fighters. It'll be just a picture of like the desert in like a crazy stadium and be like, oh. So for me, it's like Ryzen is more like check out the event as opposed to oh, check out these two fighters. You know what I'm saying? So I do agree. I don't know if this is Japanese or if this is some other type of, you know, Asian culture or whatever but i do think that there is a crazy japanese influence or something like that on these posters and i love to see it man like i said just creative we get a little too uh too plain jane in our western style sometimes man but uh enough poster talk man let's get into a little bit of uh sleeper action my man how about we do that it's time to 
time for some fight night. If you ain't paying attention, are you gonna sleep on me or I'm gonna wake you up? Okay, AJ, so we're gonna talk about some sleepers, but before we talk about the actual sleepers that we got going on right here, I just wanted to highlight there's a couple fun matchups on the prelims that we need to talk about, my man. So we got Andrew Sanchez versus Bruno Silva, a middleweight matchup. AJ, how is that not on the main card? How is it not on the main card? Oh, I don't know, Derek, because it's a big Bruno Silva. These are big dudes throwing the leather out there, too, man. It's a banger. Yeah, there's a lot. Of, there's a, a couple of these uh, sleepers that we're not going to mention that I was kind of like, man, I got to pick this one. I got to pick this one. I agree. <laughs> no, absolutely. So what I want you to do here, AJ, and this isn't going to this does not going to excuse me. This is not going to count AJ officially on our pick em sheets right here. But I want to tell me, who do you think has the edge in that matchup? It's plus 110 for Andrew Sanchez, minus 130 for Bruno Silva. Who do you like in that one? Off the jump, I kind of like Bruno Silva a little bit mm -hmm. better, but but Andrew Sanchez, man, he's a killer too as well. Um, yeah. I, I'd probably go Bruno Silva. You know what? I agree with you, man. Andrew Sanchez, he's an established veteran. This dude could walk through the fire. He could walk through the flame. He has an incredible chin, but Bruno Silva just seems to be on a different caliber right now. The man is explosive. He's dangerous, and he packs real pop in his shot. I like Bruno Silva at minus 130 as well. Danny Roberts versus Ramazan Emiv. Man, if you know anything about Ramazan Emiv, he's known for ragdolling people across the octagon all day long, and it's to no surprise. He opens as a minus 240 favorite, plus 200 comeback on the, uh, I believe, on the, the British Danny Roberts. Oh, Always a fun fight, man. Always a fun fight. Who do you like in that one, AJ? And Danny Roberts got those hands too, man. He's always Absolutely. dangerous. He can definitely crack. Um, I'm going to Meave on that one too, yeah, though, man. man. He's on an absolute storm. And like you said, just ragdolling people left and right. He's good to watch. It's one of those fighters, AJ, where I agree with you as well. I'm going with Meave on this one. I'm I'm siding on that one because uh, the wrestling is just too much, man. You know what I mean? It's one of those fighters where the, he could really control where the fight is going to take place the entire fight, man. It's always a dangerous thing to see. And always, not maybe not the most, uh, you know, exciting performance to watch, man, but the dominance is what's so exciting exciting to watch um nate or uh, actually excuse me that's my actual sleeper that we're going to break down here in a second just one more lupi godinez versus luana carolina aj just give me your comment first about what i said earlier man she took the fight seven days after defeating silvana gomez juarez um via first round armbar man dangerous stuff man she came out of there completely untouched unfazed damn near and said fuck it i'll take the fight on seven days notice having to make that weight again is going to be a little uh Interesting to see how this fight plays out because you're pretty depleted over the course of a couple of weeks, but she's confident in her capabilities. However, I do think Luana Carolina is going to take this as a little bit of a shot at her and say, oh, you think you can just come in after you fought somebody and come beat my ass? Like, you think that I'm just a scrub. Okay. So I think we're going to see a really game Carolina, but who do you like in this one? And give me your take on that, AJ. I agree, Derek. I think we're going to see a very game Carolina. You Somebody comes in, you're underestimating a little bit. That's when they're most dangerous. But I love it. I love the fact that Lupi Godinez came in and said, you know what? I'm down to I'm down to cash a bag. Let's yeah. get it going. Uh, and do fastest turnaround in all of UFC that's ever happened. You and she's up there with names, you know, absolute killers. Uh, Donald Cerrone. I, I forget the entire list, but there was like four or five people where I was like, damn, these dudes are actually yeah. turning around. Uh, the um Shemaev. i just blanked his name he fought uh hazmat Shemaev, man yeah. hazmat Shemaev is on that list too when he came in hot the, the big hazmat experiments took him off yeah. hopefully it does the same for lupi godinez i love the fact that she uh we say it all the time derek stay ready so you don't have to get ready lupi yes, godinez is in it bro i love it a lot uh on this one this it's a little bit harder for me because on paper i would go with uh carolina on this one but I'm actually gonna go Loopy, man. I'm going Loopy Godinez. I think the fire coming forward would make her a little bit, a little bit more dangerous, a little bit kind of uh, unpredictable. I'm going Loopy. I okay. what was the odds on this one? Odds on this one, Godinez actually opened up as a minus 370 favorite with a plus 290 comeback for Carolina. So the odds makers agree with you, man, right there. But on paper, I kind of, I kind of feel what you're saying, man. Carolina's a little longer, you know what I mean? She has a little. Uh, she has a little tenacity in her too, man. And Godinez with that come forward style, unless she grabs her up, gets her to the ground and smashes her there, I think it's going to be interesting to see how the battle goes on the feet. But uh, I think I'm going to go Lupi Godinez as well on this one, man. I just think that the momentum is in her favor. But then again, you can never discount a motivated fighter. And Carolina, I think, will be very motivated. But uh, enough of the prelim stuff, man, or I guess enough of that prelim stuff. Let's talk about our actual sleepers, AJ. And let's start off with the first one that you have, my man. So you have uh, Dana Storm Bakari. He is 9-2. and two. He's fighting out of Mongolia, and he is fighting an established UFC veteran, a man who's got another shot in the UFC, who uh, he won four fights in the regional scene after losing back-to-back -back split decisions to Kyung Ho Kong and Giga Chikadze back in 2019, in August and September of 2019 specifically, man. 
Brandon Davis fighting out of Mississippi, USA. He's 14 and 8. What do you like about this fight, AJ? Man, I love this. This fight is going to be an absolute banger, Derek. Like you said, Dana Betgari, this homeboy is an absolute killer in the cage. KO power, incredibly fast, fighting out of Jackson Wing. So you know he's going to come prepared. He's going to be ready to scrap. It's just that Albuquerque style is something different, Derek. And like, you know, Bakgari, he likes to pressure. He'll stay busy and he can flow. And when he's in that flow of the fight, that's when he's most dangerous, man. In his last fight, he dropped the dude stepping backwards with a crazy left hook. And whether he's leading or countering, absolute flow and he can hit you hard both ways man dangerous and great footwork as well but davis davis man you can't count a guy out who has had you know the shot of the ufc had it taken away from him and worked hard to get back in like you said he went on that four fight winning streak and i think i i think there's three of the four fights were a ko i could be wrong on that stat i, I don't have it written down but i do remember his last one in his last fight just absolutely demolished a guy in like some some like 45 seconds or something with a ko absolutely crazy and honestly in his last ufc stint man he probably did the best we've seen anybody handle chikadze a lot of uh chikadze's really been kicking people in the liver and hurting them and absolute star power going forward but davis had him hurt man davis had him where we've seen him at his worst stuck on the cage but planted against the ground, really having to work for get-ups. And Davis Davis fought a good fight, even though he lost the split decision. But again, split decision against G- Giga Chikadze. Like, that's a that's a pretty high tout in its own, man. Uh, he, you know, he did go back to the regional scene, know all that stuff, but he stays very composed and very technical, man. So we got a storm, and I think that's mm-hmm. even Bagari's name, man. Yep. A storm fighter versus a dude who stays very composed. It's going to be very interesting. And I like this fight, Derek, because Bagari is absolutely very dangerous. Dangerous. And folks, you're going to have to remember this dude's name. Yeah. You better tune in to the prelims because this dude can easily be a champ one day. But don't discount Davis, all right? Davis is there and granted, he's been, uh, you know, granted a second chance. And on the big show, when you get that opportunity, you cannot waste it. And I think that's how Davis is coming into this mentally. It's going to be a lot of fun, Derek. What else do you think about this fight? Well, I agree with you there. I will say that Brandon Davis and that four fight win streak, he uh, went on in Gulf Coast MMA, it was the regional uh, promotion that he was fighting in. It was two of the four came via knockout, the other two were via decision. Um, listen, man, he has a will to win, he has the ability to take the fight to the ground and control his opponent which is going to be interesting to see against Bakari because uh, the man is a killer on the feet but he hasn't really been tested on the ground in the UFC specifically uh five significant strikes landed per minute for Davis at about a 35 percent clip does worry me a little bit however the man has that will to win like I said he will walk forward he'll walk through the flames and all that but for Bakari man interesting you said he's he dropped a dude with a step back left hook in his last fight he didn't drop just a dude he dropped Kevin Natividad man a man with bombs in his hand so that was really interesting to see because, uh, you know, listen, if you're Bakari, you're a man who throws with intention. You're very efficient in your fight style. You're not throwing wasted things, no wasted movements. You can fight just as well moving forward or moving backwards. Got real pop in your shot. And that accuracy, that pinpoint accuracy and efficiency that I was talking about, I think is what lends to the KOs. But ultimately, man, seven of his nine wins are via stoppage. So I agree with you, Bakari. Remember the name because this is going to be a big test. And if you could pass the test of Brandon Davis, an established UFC veteran, it's time to really... Uh, uh, bring this man up in terms of the division, man, and give him some real, real tests, man. So that's going to be a very fun fight, folks. Definitely tune in for that. I believe that's like the second or third bout on the prelims, man. So definitely tune in. Let's move on to another sleeper, AJ. This one right here, I honestly believe could be a main event bout, but I think it's not. And the reason why is because both of these fighters are coming off of some pretty nasty losses. Um, one of them Listen, man, this dude was the guy who was being propelled up the division. He had so much hype on him, and he lost a big, big, big fight against Mike Trezano in his last fight. And if you're talking about, if you know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about Ludovic, Mr. Highlight Klein, man. So he lost to Mike Trezano in his last fight. This dude was on maybe a seven, eight, nine fight win streak, hadn't lost since 2017, and lost a decision. And I'm talking about a man who has 16 of his 17 victories via stoppage. That's incredible. But he's fighting a very game, a wild man, and Nate the Train Landwehr, AJ. So I think the last time Landwehr was supposed to scrap, his bout got canceled. We haven't seen the man in a minute, and the last fight that he had was against Julian Arosa, where he caught a nasty knee to the face and was slumped over, knocked out, AJ. 14-4 and four is Landwehr, 17-3 and three is Ludovic Klein. AJ, this is the, the thing that stands out to me about this sleeper right here. 
You have a technician in Klein. You have a dude who's got a nasty, crisp, fast lead hand, uses feints all over the place, right? Versus a landwehr who says, yeah, fuck all that. I'm going to walk forward and I'm going to bang. And the more of a dogfight I'm in, the better I get, the more my confidence grows here, AJ. To me, sometimes, and this is going to be a terrible analogy because I'm talking about two completely levels of skill, um, two completely different levels of skill, but you remember Mayweather versus um, uh, Maidana, right? You remember the, those couple fights and how Mayweather had a little bit of trouble because Maidana was throwing in crazy angles, just wild, unpredictable, just pressing the pace, no respect. This is what this fight reminds me of, and this is why I like it so much, because Nate Landwehr does not give a damn about how technical you are and all that. He's walking forward. You saw the battle he got in with the damaged Darren Elkins, AJ. Talk to me about this one, man. Does this excite you? Does Do you see this matchup and say, ooh, okay, this is going to be a banger? Because that's the thing that popped off the page as soon as I looked at the matchup. What do you think? Yeah, Derek, this is one of those fights that I saw in the prelims where I jumped. I was like, man, I got to make this one the sleeper. Like, this one's going to be hot. And yeah, you said it. Nate Landwehrs, he's an absolute crazy man. Some would say his last finish that he got, he got, he caught the fat knee from Julian Arosa. Some would say it's an early finish, an early yeah, stoppage. Yeah. I don't know. He could, he did get slumped <laughs> over. The ref called it. You know, it is what it is. Entertaining nonetheless. He even had Arosa hurt. And that's the crazy thing about, uh, about Nate Landwehr, man. You can be in the fight with this dude. You hurt him. Doesn't matter. He's still coming forward. He's exactly. still swinging, and he'll hurt you back. He even hurt Julian Rosa in that fight. Yeah, dude's dude's down for a war, an absolute crazy man, and he uh, has the power to finish people, man. It's a crazy thing. Nate Willanwear, he was on a hell of a run too, uh, or at least he was being propelled pretty pretty yeah. stoutly in the media, um, and and going up against Klein, dude. They call him Mister Highlight for a reason. I mean, it's it's rare when. Uh, I don't know if you watched uh, like WWE when you were a kid, Derek, Absolutely. but everybody would have like the finishing move. You know, mm -hmm. they'd always hit the, the the tombstone pile driver or whatever, <laughs> man. I used to love it back in the day as a kid. And UFC, you don't really see that because there's so many dangerous moves that people can finish by, except for uh, Mr. Highlight, you know, uh, Ludovic Klein. This dude, he catches you with that left high kick to the face. Yeah, you're out. And he sets it up so nicely. Like you said, man, that lead hand is so fast and the feints he has, he gets you biting. Yeah, he, he easily K you uh, KO you, right? You re you reach one time for a little block on a jab or something, bah, kick comes over the top. Ew, it's rough. Yeah, this one's, this one's an absolute banger. Absolutely, and I'm glad that you brought up the signature move because I was about to bring that one up, man. It's rare in the UFC to have a signature move, man. There's so many different ways you could finish somebody, but to constantly, similar to uh, Mickey Gall, which, I mean, I know people laugh the name off or whatever, but respect the man because I believe he has like five of his like seven or eight or nine wins via rear naked choke. Like that's his signature move right there. If you can keep getting it, and everyone knows you keep getting it, but you still keep getting it, it's impressive, man. So yeah, watch out for the roundhouse kick for Ludovic Klein, man. But uh, like I said, the brawling style of land where it might give him some trouble with some problems that's what mike trezano did to him he bullied him he didn't respect him and technicians sometimes have issues with that man so watch the prelims folks we got all types of bangers on these prelims we just broke down two of them we just highlighted a couple other ones and uh real quick aj just because we were given kind of who we were feeling more and more in these matchups for the uh bot Gary versus brandon davis who are you feeling on that one i'll say the odds on that one right now are uh minus 195 for bot Gary plus 165 for brandon davis who do you like on that one yeah, I'm going Bakari on that one, man. I think Bakari is just too much of a dog to handle in that one. Who you got? I think the stand-up is going to be a little bit too much, unless Brandon Davis can really control him on the ground, which we haven't seen anybody do that to him yet, man. I think it's going to be a short night on the feet for Dana Bakari, who's coming off, or Dana Bakari, excuse me, who's coming off of back-to-back uh, -back knockout wins, man. Very impressive. Um, now, when we're talking about Nate Landwehr, who is a plus 230 underdog with a minus 280 uh, favorite in Ludovic Klein, man, who do you like there? The odds makers seem to really like Klein even though he's coming off of a big win against a fighter who basically has the same style as uh mike trezano you know in his last fight so who do, who do you like there i'm going nate landwehr on this one those odds kind of surprise me because uh a lot of the times i honestly think both of these styles when you have a wild man and a technician they're kind of the kryptonite for each other and it's yeah. whoever has the best night so we've seen a lot of the times like uh, i I'd, I'd say israel adesanya is one of the more technician fighters he's a real sniper in there yeah. and anytime he has a guy who's just a crazy man he's handles him no problem but that's not always the case man and, and nate landwehr is one of the ones where you really got to finish this dude to put him out um yeah i'm going nate landwehr on that one what about you 
I like Nate Landwehr in this spot. He's due for a big, big win here. However, for Ludovic Klein, I think he's going to be more motivated than ever coming off of his first loss since 2017. The man only has three losses in his 25 MMA career. And uh, the pressure is going to be on, man. Sometimes pressure makes you. Sometimes pressure breaks you. But I'm going to go with Klein due to the track record, man. Like I said, 16 of 17 wins via stoppage. The man knows how to finish people. Maybe there was just some jitters in that fight. Maybe it was just a bad look. But uh, if he loses again here, big, big momentum for Landwehr. And it's going to be a big drop in the ranking there for Ludovic Klein who is uh he's very fairly new to the promotion regardless okay AJ let's hit some main card here's to another main card breakdown courtesy of your hosts Derek G and AJ and of course folks if you're still tuned in with us drop a like subscribe hit the YouTube channel bloodywaterpodcast.com or bloodywaterpodcast just on the Googles man Google us duck duck go us whatever browsing engine you use man hit us up you dig you already know what time it is all right AJ so we're gonna start off with a very fun matchup in the middleweight division Julian the Cuban missile crisis marquez opens up as a minus 230 favorite with a plus 190 comeback for jordan the beverly hills ninja right let's uh before we talk about the matchup man let's talk about the matchup of nicknames these are two of the best nicknames head to head that we've seen in quite some time cuban missile cuban missile crisis excuse me versus beverly hills ninja which nickname do you like more Probably the missile crisis. Mm -hmm. I, although I gotta love the shout out to uh, Chris Farley with the yeah. Beverly Hills Ninja, <laughs> but I'm going just Cuba missile crisis. It sounds great. You know, you have the Bay of Pigs and everything. I, yeah. I like that one a lot better. What about you? I think it's close. I think it's very close. But I'm gonna edge out for the Cuban missile crisis. It just it's a little tougher. The Beverly Hills Ninja. It's a little comedic, but it's not funny when he's in there knocking your fucking block off in the cage, man. So that's partly why I give the you know the 50 50 split, but a little bit of edge for Marquez. Nonetheless, 9 and 2 is Julian Marquez, 3 and 1 in the UFC, 12 and 1 is Jordan Wright, 2 and 1 in the UFC. Now, Jordan Wright has only lost once in his career and it was to Joaquin Buckley, he got knocked out. However, he does a lot of knocking out himself. Julian Marquez has never been knocked out, never been submitted. He has lost two fights via decision though. So, AJ Let's talk about the matchup. Julian Marquez, he could be a slow starter at times, and that's going to really make or break this matchup right here. But for Jordan Wright, he is a man who is very composed, even when he's under pressure. And I think we saw that against in the Buckley fight, even though it didn't pan out the way that he wanted it to. We saw that he was able to handle some of the pressure of, uh, of Joaquin Buckley. However, do you think that the slow start might be really problematic here for Marquez, who Jordan Wright can get you out of there with one punch? I mean, Marquez can too, but Jordan Wright can as well. So what do you think? I definitely think so, especially because Jordan Wright is a faster starter, too, and he's he's always down. He doesn't mind. He's a karate striker. He doesn't mind fighting off the back foot, and he also is very good striking off the front foot as well, man. Um, and it, the way this matchup has, if, if Jordan Wright can get those kicks going, it's going to be a lot of trouble for Julian Marquez. It's always hard to start when a dude just keeps kicking you from far away. And all you really have is power shots or you're trying to work your hands, trying to get in on him. And he just keeps side kicking you, leg kicking you, hooks, you know, just it's it's a crazy interesting one. And even if Jordan or uh, excuse me, Julian Marquez does kind of come on the inside, Jordan Wright has some crazy knees to answer for him too, man. I think this one's going to be a very fun technical stand up, but don't discount uh, Julian Marquez because he has those sneaky submissions. Like oh, yeah. he'll literally, things will happen out of nowhere, boom, submission attempt like that. Yeah. Like it's crazy. And for a dude that thick and like that big, they're, they're fighting in the middleweight. But Julian uh, Mar Marquez is an absolute specimen of a, of a human being. For being that big, he's also very, very fast. I agree with you, man. The thing that is interesting about his submissions is what I have written down in my notes. None of his submissions come from takedowns, man. Like he doesn't take you down. I'm going to submit you. It's something random. Oh, snatch the guillotine. You know what I mean? Something random. Oh, I'm going to go for the darts. You know, it's like it's those random unpredictable events, which is uh, Jordan Wright does doesn't often fall into those those brand and predictable events too often though man if you're looking at a takedown average per 15 minutes both of them have zero at zero percent right there you know what i'm saying like they're looking to stand and bang that's what they do that's how these knockouts are coming from or where the knockouts are coming from however takedown defense 53 percent for marquez 100 percent for jordan wright interesting note there and julian marquez he does have a much higher submission average i mean even though jordan wright has five submission wins none of them are in the ufc so that's why that stat is that now let's talk about just like legitimately on the feet, man. Julian Marquez, he likes to walk you down and he's kind of like the Terminator, man. If you watch him, you can hit him as many times as you want. He's pressuring forward and he's very flat footed, which I think does well for his cardio. He's not bouncing around too much like a Jordan Wright is. He's just stalking you, ready to drop bombs on you. But AJ, I think that Jordan Wright stand up is much more technical than Julian Marquez is. No offense here, but I see Marquez throw shots sometimes that it's like, a professional MMA fighter doesn't necessarily throw those shots. You know what I'm saying? It's just like the boxing can be a little clunky at times. But don't get me wrong. Even if he lands that clunky hit on you, you're going to sleep. 
So technical versus a little less technical. Who do you think has the edge overall in the standup? I know their standups are different, but who has the edge? Faster, maybe a Jordan Wright, maybe. He's a little slow for the middleweight division. Power, I think, got to go to Marquez. Who do you think? Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly on all of those, man. I said the exact same thing. Wright's going to have the technical stand-up advantage. And, I'll, and and what I like about Wright's stand-up, too, he has more weapons to hit you with. Whereas, like you said, with Marquez, he's a little bit more flat-footed, a little bit more plodding around. He's just going to stalk you down, throw those big shots, start winging shots. And if he connects, I give him the power advantage as well. But it's hard to say because Jordan Wright also has some serious power on them. Uh, and then I mean, just stand-up alone overall – I'd give it to Jordan Wright just because of the the amount of tools he has in his toolbox that he's able to pull out, whether it's knees, kicks, elbows, you know, fists flying. He has a lot of them, and he can hurt you in, in these weird angles. The only difference, though, man, in the in the defense, Jordan or uh, Julian Marquez is defensively very sound. Yeah. Whereas if Jordan Wright gets hurt, he starts reaching. He starts yeah. kind of putting his hands out there trying to block stuff, which. In, in in karate they do teach you, you know is step out and actually block stuff but that's how you get that's how you get ko if somebody comes around a hook on that one we saw it in the buckley fight he started reaching and buckley just went right around the hand and boop, tap the chin out you see one thing about that buckley fight though that i thought was that i just think the speed was a little too much for jordan right like buckley is so fast for the middleweight division because he's not a real middleweight really you know what i mean this dude stepping on the scale at like 183 drinking body armor you know what i'm saying <laughs> trying to like get that weight up a little bit so to see a real middleweight versus another real middleweight in jordan Wright versus julian marquez i honestly think that the one person who lands the clean shot wins the fight like this is a very even matchup to me even though marquez is a minus 230 favorite so let's talk about odds there do you agree with the line here aj I personally no, but mm -hmm. I can see where it's coming from. A lot of the times I'm like, man, what are these guys thinking? But I can see it just because Julian Marcus is a little bit more um what's what's the word I want to say? Like uh like in the media. Like he's okay. he's a little bit more present, he's a little bit more at least has the hype around him where Jordan Wright just really he's he kind of looks goofy, you know. He <laughs> he's he's not really talking shit, he's not staying relevant, he's just there to fight. He's kind of like a Wonder Boy. How Wonder Boy never really caught steam, never yeah. really caught a big fan base until he became I don't even remember if he champ or not. That goes to so that goes to show right there. Like I yeah. yeah, it doesn't really even uh didn't get the 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 fans behind him. And I could see the same thing happening for Jordan Wright, but he is fighting out of an absolute banger of a camp, so you can't discount that. That's what I was going to say, man. Jackson Wink MMA, man. The great state of New Mexico is where Jordan Wright is training out of. Julian Marquez, though, training out of glory, MMA, and fitness. So this is going to be uh, Winkle John, right, versus James Krause. I mean, who are you giving the edge to, man? Try to take the bias hat off for like two seconds, man. You feel me? James Cross is probably going to be motivated as ever being that last week he just cost his fighter Tim Elliott. I'm not going to say he cost it, but he's taking accountability. He told Tim Elliott he was up two rounds to zero when, uh, yeah, didn't end up being that way. Not in the judge's eyes, at least. So who has the edge in the camp here, AJ? Yeah, man, this one, this is actually going to be a really good fight because in the chaos, I think Marquez can win it. If he gets a little dirty, makes it a crazy fight. I think, I think Marquez can get it done. If it stays technical, right all day long. And me personally, bias aside, uh, I, I'm going with the karate style, man. Yeah, right. I like, I like right. I think he's going to be striking. I think he's going to be staying at length on this one. I'm going with the underdog, man. I see a little bit of value in that plus 190. I'm going right by decision, though. I don't think okay. either of these guys are going to be able to finish each other. I think it's going to be able to come in the late rounds. That could be wrong, though. Both these dudes are absolute killers and have the power to get it done. So, who you got and why, Derek? Well, I will just comment on this really quickly, man. If you're going decision on Marquez versus Wright, this would be the first decision that either of these fighters will have won in. In their entire careers jordan wright has never lost a decision actually man like i said his only loss would be a knockout marquez has lost two decisions though early in his career now i will say that uh i mean not super early in his career man only has 11 fights but uh notable wins sam alvey darren stewart phil hawes and maki patolo for julian marquez Ike Villanueva is really the only notable win for Jordan Wright. So experience is definitely going to be a factor here. But I agree with you, AJ. I'm seeing value in the plus 190 line of Jordan Wright. I think if he could start quick and Julian Marquez comes out to his patented slow starts, I think it could be a really early night, man. And I don't know if he would be able to knock him out or submit him. I guess we'll just find out then. But I think Jordan Wright is going to be motivated, man. And every time we discount the man, he comes back and wins. So that's the thing is, is he's a dangerous man always. Forget about how goofy it is or whatever the case may be. He is a killer in the ring. So both of us going on Jordan Wright, going with the underdog pick there, man. 
right on. I'll take it. I'll take it. We can move on to the next one. So AJ, this is the sleeper that I had just a few weeks ago that is now a main card bout, and I love to see it. And the reason why is because if you do not know who the beast is, Manon Firo, if you do not know her name, you better learn it right now, remember it, and do not forget that name, because I'm telling you this much, man. She is a killer waiting to get the hype. She is a, fr like, she's coming out of that, like, French scene, the Cyril Gans, the Manon Firo's, you know, she's like part of that French generation coming through and making their mark on the UFC, especially when we're talking about kickboxing, man. She is a star-studded kickboxer, a decorated kickboxer, and we've seen, man, it's hard to touch her when you're in there. You know, it's very hard to touch her, but she's facing a real problem, Myra Bueno Silva. So, AJ, let's talk about the line here. Minus 210 is Manon Firo, plus 175 comeback for Bueno Silva. Both of these fighters are 7-1. 7-1 in MMA, 2-0 in the UFC is Fioro, 2-1-1 is Myra Bueno Silva, and let's not forget, she just came off of a draw to Montana De La Rosa, a very experienced UFC fighter. Now, when we're talking about Fioro, her only wins have come against Victoria Leonardo, which I'm not trying to hate, but that's not the best competition in the world, and uh, Tabitha Ricci, who also jumped up a weight class, like you, she looked like a very small person in the cage compared to Fioro, so it's hard to really say like, oh man, she's really ready for the big shot, but this is going to prove it right here. AJ this one right here so you got a power you got bombs in the hands for Myra Bueno Silva versus more of a technician volume striker in Manon Fioro who do you like in this one AJ man like who stands out to you who pops off the page when you look at this matchup man Fioro mm -hmm. Fioro all day and don't get me wrong I like I like Bueno Silva as well she's very dangerous she's got heavy hands she can get a little crazy and she has a ground game as well to go with it she's a little bit more well well rounded of a fighter but I like Fioro a lot on this one man she has a lot more technical of a, of a striking style as well as she throws that karate style front kick that just she basically uses it like a jab and she'll just keep it going the whole time and not only that her hands are so fast that's where the power comes from doesn't load up on the shots throws them right from the shoulder but turns those hips and absolutely demolishes her opponents when she gets them up against the cage they don't really know what to do whenever those hands are flying in the in her last fight against Tabitha Ricci I mean she she beat up my girl baby shark so I was a little <laughs> I was a little jaded in that one but uh my uh, Michael uh I just blanked his name. Uh, Bisping? Thank you so much, Derek. Yeah. I had a brain fart right there. Michael Bisping said it, man. He's She's got fists of fury. And literally, when they're flying, she's fast. She'll throw crazy combos and she's slick with the combos too even if they're just like um you know not really landing the hardest of shots she'll hit you with five shots in a row and then you're sitting there like wondering like, what the hell's going on as you're trying to circle out and she's kicking you in the stomach man i like Firo a lot on this one i think i think that uh that favorite that 210 favorite is there for a reason i think the uh, odds makers are seeing exactly what i'm seeing who do you like in this one what stood out to you the most i really like Firo in this one man but i really like buena silva as well bueno silva excuse me i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about these two stats really quickly man because these two stats are very interesting to me so and Fiora only has two fights in the UFC both wins both knockouts right and in those two fights she's landed 50 plus significant strikes at a 48 percent and oh and up and over right uh accuracy in both of those bouts right so 50 plus shots landed significant strikes 48 percent clip that's very legit right I mean if that sounds good to you AJ wait till you hear this Bueno Silva in her two wins in the UFC right because she's two one and one and the two wins um that have gone to decision or something of that nature right or actually the two fights i take that back aj sorry i'm butchering this the two fights that she has fought that have gone to decision in the ufc she has landed 50 plus significant strikes at a 56 percent and over accuracy right so that's interesting to me because if you would talk about her first win in the ufc that was i think it was a submission win like an arm bar over jillian robertson um then she got another big win over uh, romero bohella right that was another submission win but in the loss to marina Moroz, man i mean she was landing a bunch of shots i think she got about 80 significant strikes landed there so she's a volume puncher but she's accurate too which is really interesting to me because if she's got the power edge and she's just as accurate if not more accurate than manon Firo. I mean, what does that say? Is it the people standing in front of her are easy to hit? I'll tell you, um, Marina Moroz, she is not an easy fighter to hit. I'll tell you that much, man. And she's a volume puncher too, man. So it's going to be interesting because it's kind of almost the same style that we're seeing here. So with that being said, I do like Firo. I give her the edge in this one, but Bueno Silva is mean, AJ. And that's the one thing that is interesting that stands out to me in this matchup is that if you're a Manon Firo, you're the fist of fear, you're the beast, you're the one who's just fucking everybody up and doing all that. And now you're faced up with somebody who is not 
scared of you, who's willing to walk forward and not just walk forward and be a punching bag, but walk forward and land her own blows, her own real deal shots. I think it's going to be an eye opening experience and an eye opening, an eye opening, excuse me, uh, revelation that we're going to see about Manon Firo to see if she's truly ready to take a step up in the women's flyweight division. Because some people are saying, AJ, I'm not saying it, but some people are saying this might be our only hope, the great hope that could potentially contend with the Valentina Shevchenko up in the next couple of years. You know what I'm saying? So who's to say that Shevchenko wouldn't have already moved on from the division by this point or whatever, but Furo is the one great hope that we have right now. But then again, it's a little disrespectful to say, being that she's only defeated Tabitha Ricci and Victoria Leonardo in the UFC so far. So we need to see more, and this is going to be the big test, like I said. So with that being said, AJ, um, we got the kickboxer versus somebody who is a big power puncher, a big brawler who's got, uh, listen, man, mean kicks, knees, and punches. Myra Bueno Silva, I think, has... Just as many weapons as Furo, but just in a different style. Um, but she does also have five submission victories, and that's what's going to be interesting. We have not seen Furo been tested on the ground yet. How do you think that factors into this fight, AJ? That's what I was going to ask you, Derek. I, uh, I, I feel like Myra Benasilva's best way to win this one, catch one of those sidekicks, get her to the ground. We haven't seen how Furo handles it, and that's really the best, I think, the, the, the way Myra Silva can use her techniques against her. Um, I, I definitely think it's like one of the aspects Myra Benasilva needs to do going forward. And I, like you said, we haven't, we haven't seen it happen yet. And I'm one of those ones saying, I think Furo, at least right now, Furo's style, is one of the ones that can test with uh, Valentina Shevchenko. Um, it's just she's so dominant, it's hard to say. So don't get me wrong. I do think my uh, Manon Firo needs to have a little bit more weight behind her, not necessarily in pounds, but as far as like killers on her hit list. But I think that style has a lot to offer going forward. Um, I do think Myra Buena Silva has a better shot in the, in the stand-up than a lot of her other opponents have against Firo, especially in her last fight against Montana De La Rosa. That's what, man, those, those shots were landing hard. I mean, you saw De La Rosa really getting hurt and covering up and trying to get Absolutely. things to the ground, where she's a little bit more dominant on the ground in that fight, but I think the tables are turned in this fight. What do you think? Do you think uh, Buena Silva is going to have to get this to the ground for get things going? Well, I think it could be a good a good method of, of trying to get the victory, but at the same time, I've seen Buena Silva get controlled on the ground in a couple of her fights, man, against Marina Moroz, who is basically the same frame as Furo. She was just, I mean, smothering her top control like it was nobody's business. So Furo, we've seen she can handle the top control she's on top she's good but we haven't seen her on bottom yet and that's what's going to be interesting so i think that her best shot honestly to hang with furo is going to be on the feet a power puncher versus a volume puncher and we'll just see may the best woman win on this one man so let's give our picks aj who you got on this one and why I'm going with the karate style, the kickboxing style again. I really like, like I said, man, I love that front kick flying out, that front side kick she uses like a jab. It's hard to do. And, the, and what's nice is both these girls are around the same height, uh, around the same reach as well. But that reach is a little bit nulli uh, nullified whenever it's the leg that's reaching out and not the Absolutely. hands. She, she can hit you from another like foot and a half away. So I'm going for your row. I'm going KO round two. I think Ooh. it's going to be a fun night. Going to get a finish right in the middle. Um, I just think she's levels of Above Bueno Silva on the feet, as far as the technician aspect about it. But don't get me wrong, Bueno Silva can get that KO if she catches there. Who you got and why? I have bold predictions once again, my man. So I'm going to rock with the beast. I'm going with Manon Furo as well. But I see this one playing out as a decision. Myra Buena Silva, I'm giving her some respect because she's never been finished in her career. Her one loss is via decision. That was to Marina Moroz. And uh, listen, she deals out punishment. Like I said, there's something There's something like that's the intangible to me personally um, in Myra Buena Silva. She crushes space in her fights, man, and she's mean and she wants to hurt her opponent. And you could tell. You could see it in her face. Like she wants to hurt you. Like, you know what I mean? She punches you and she's like, yeah, come here what's up you know what i'm saying let's do this you know so it's going to be interesting to see and i think it's going to be a big test whoever wins is going to get a big step up in the division but i'm going with the beast manon Puro via decision all right ages move on to the next one okay jim a10 miller versus eric the ghost pepper gonzalez man now listen it's a shame no headshot from my man eric gonzalez but uh this dude is a, a little decorated out there in uh combate global combate america the copa you know all that the tournaments how they're in combate global um but this is gonna be this is just interesting to me off the jump aj i'm my question is like okay jim miller he is at the stage of his career where the ufc says now we have to fight all the all the young guns man this is where we've come to at this point he's coming off of two losses to vince pichel and joe selecki um and now he has to fight a ufc debutante and eric gonzalez now even though eric gonzalez has 19 fights in his mma career this is his ufc debut man 
Tell me, before we break down this matchup, what this means about the trajectory of where Jim Miller can go in his career at this point. Like, this is the beginning of the end, basically, right? This is like the Andre Arlovsky, like, approach, right? Yeah, it, it really is the beginning of the end. But like Andre Arlovsky, I'm glad you made that yeah. correlation between the two. Because like Andre Arlovsky, he keeps getting these dubs. Yeah. He solidifies himself as that guy, as that gatekeeper that's going to keep introducing the young guns. And some can take this as a... Uh, one of those fights where, like, all right, the UFC matchmakers, that you know, you you did us a favor in finding these two dudes. We're gonna throw you one. Yeah. I don't really see it that way in this one, man. Eric Gonzalez, he is very well decorated in Combate Global, like you said, Combate America, all all that area, man. He's doing really well and he's KOing people a lot of the time. Um, it's just hard when it's your debut. You know, the lights are big against no. a big star like Jim Miller, and and the whole time Eric Gonzalez was calling people out. He was calling out Donald Cerrone. He was calling out all these people, and he got Jim Miller. He got a hell of a fight ahead of him. Uh, it's going to be interesting, especially Gonzalez on 10 days short notice fight. You know, 10, 10 days to get UFC ready. It's a pretty tall task going forward, man. You know, AJ, sometimes the proverb of uh, be careful what you wish for is something that we need to take into account here. Jim Miller is one of the most experienced fighters in the UFC. I believe that he is up there for most fights in the UFC. He's up there with Cowboy Cerrone. I mean, the man has, what, 32 and 16? I think that's like 50. My math is terrible, but we up there near 50, right? Something like that. Um, listen, Jim Miller, he's a southpaw, 5'8", 71-inch reach, and if we're talking about Eric Gonzalez, orthodox, 5'11", 75-inch reach, right? So the height's going to be there for Eric Gonzalez, but one of the things that he's best known for is his wrestling. Now, do you want to be best known for your wrestling and implement that against one of the best wrestlers in the UFC, in Jim Miller? Maybe not. Even when we saw against, I believe, Joe Selecki, man, Jim Miller. I mean, Joe Selecki is a very, very decorated grappler. Jim Miller was able to hold top control on him for quite some time. He lost the fight via split decision, or via unanimous decision, excuse me. But it still goes to show the wrestling chops are legit on Jim Miller, man. Now, the question becomes the stand-up, which is where I think Eric Gonzalez will have his most success. The man, I've been talking about will and heart and, and being able to walk through the fire. There's few people that encompass that better than Eric the Ghost Pepper Gonzalez, AJ. Have you watched a couple of these fights specifically against Walk Sick Park? Man, he had a banger against him where he's just walking forward, man. He's getting hurt. He's keep walking forward. He won that fight via TKO round two, man. It was a, it was one of the highlight reel knockouts for Eric Gonzalez, which was like totally cool and all that. But at the same time, man, UFC, you see much better knockouts in the UFC than you do uh, right there in the Combate Globals. What do you think about this fight, AJ? Yeah, no, I, I was watching a couple of his fights, and I really like him, again, like you said, for that grit and determination. Yeah. I also watched the uh, the Rafa Gonzalez. Rafa, yeah, yeah. Rafa yeah, Garcia. Garcia. Garcia, thank yeah. you. I knew it was a... Uh, Anyway, against the Rafa fight, he was he was looking really good, and he continued to get taken down, but he continued to stand right back up and yeah. started swinging and banging. We, I, I like the guy for that, man. The Ghost Pepper is a good nickname for him. He's spicy. He'll stay in the fight. You know, he's going to let you know he's there. He might not hurt you the most, but he's going to let you know he's there. A good chin. He's willing to go to war. Comfortable on the ground, but, I mean, there's levels on this one, man. One of the things about Jim Miller – he gets on the ground. That submission can go up in a split second. Next thing you know, you're sleeping. If it hits the ground, I got Jim Miller as a favorite on this one. And man, it's like I said, it's just a uh, it's a tough notice when you're taking a ten day notice, short notice fight for UFC and the yeah. biggest promotion. Even though you're working, you know he's I forget how many years he's been fighting, but nineteen fights out there. Is that right? Yeah, nineteen, yeah, 19 fights. Yeah. It's a long time. It's a long yeah. time being on the regional scene. He has a lot behind him. But just against this caliber of opponent, it's going to be hard. And I do like that Eric Gonzalez is the longer, lengthier guy. And he's going to need to depend on that length and that ability to keep at distance and start striking really hard because we've seen Jim Miller just kind of walk through the storm and, and be able to handle a lot of different looks that his opponents give him, man. What do you think? Well, I agree with you, man. Jim Miller, to me, you know, even though he has all this great, you know, top control, the intangible of massive experience in the UFC, he's still a bit sloppy in the pocket when he's talking about his boxing, right? You know, but he does have a big right hook counter shot, man. You know what I'm saying? So you got to be careful if you're Gonzalez because... Jim Miller's more of the, at this point of his career, that big power, small volume, right? You know, one big shot at a time, you know, maybe two in a row or something like that. But I do think that 
the big thing that we keep talking about here, just the experience and the levels, man. Jim Miller, it's like, I think that the odds makers, once again, so folks, I'm seeing a lot of value in minus 195 for Jim Miller. I'm surprised that this line isn't higher because, yeah, he's coming off of two losses in a row, but he didn't look bad in the losses. It's not like he looked terrible. And look at his competition, man. Um, in his last five, Clay Guida, Scott Holtzman, Roosevelt Roberts, Vince Pichel, Joe Selecki. Like, you got real deal killers out here in the UFC. And if we're talking about uh, Eric Gonzalez, I say one of the toughest guys that he fought, which was the only loss in his last five, was against uh, Humberto Bondanai, right? And that was, dude, that was big stakes, AJ. I think that was for like $10,000 that they were fighting for. And Bondanai just got the better of him. And I don't know, I know that name of Bondanai. I don't know where I've seen the man fight before, but he is not a slouch by any stretch of the imagination. But like I said, levels to this i don't have too much to say other than jim miller advantage on the ground eric gonzalez i don't want to say advantage on the feet but i like his chances on the feet better than i like jim miller's chances on the feet um and i think that's going to be the one way to win so we're going to see does the young experienced cat making his ufc debut come in and play uh, uh spoiler and say all right jim miller sorry three losses in a row i'm getting you towards the chopping block or, like we said at the beginning of this, does Jim Miller say, I'm going to go the Arlovsky approach, man. I'm just going to keep winning, keep putting these young young guns in front of me. I'm going to keep winning, and you're going to have to keep me around. Because uh, the man known, uh, known as Jim Miller, he's 38 years old, man, a very prime age of 38. So he's still got a couple good years left in him, man. Let's not, let's not be crazy here. But, uh, yeah, 29 years old is Gary Gonzalez. So it's going to be young versus old here. Who do you like here, AJ? Who wins and why? Yeah, I like the way you said that uh, Jim Miller definitely has the advantage on the feet and I wouldn't give necessarily, or, uh, excuse me, Jim Miller has the advantage on the ground yeah. and I wouldn't necessarily give the advantage to Eric Gonzalez on the feet, but I think that's where his shot is best at. Mm -hmm. But me personally, I'm going Jim Miller, TKO submission round one. I think he's going to get the young gun out early. And like you said before, you got to be careful what you ask for because you just might get it. And in this form, it might be an ass whooping by Jim Miller. A-10 Jim Miller. <laughs> A -10. Who you got, Derek, and why? Well, listen, 18 submission wins for Jim Miller in his decorated 32 victory career. Four knockouts, 10 decisions. And if we're talking about Eric Gonzalez, once again, you're a bold man. Eric Gonzalez has never been knocked out. He has been submitted twice three uh, losses via decision. I see a submission win coming here for Jim Miller, man. I see a very good top control and a very sneaky submission coming up in round two or three. I'm going to go three just to, you know what I mean, be a little cautious on here, but I'm going Jim Miller submission round three on here. However, it would be very impressive to see Eric Gonzalez go the distance on that one, man. If you look at his uh, last five, his own, like I said, his only loss was a decision loss to uh, Humberto Bond and I, man. So be interesting to see here, but a uh, very interesting matchup, man. And we're talking about gatekeepers. We're going to talk about another one here. Listen, man, the pit bull, Andre Arlovsky, minus 110, minus 110 against Carlos Boy Felipe, man. Now, Andre Arlovsky, man, this is the ageless wonder. We're talking, he's 3-2 and two in his last five. His two losses have come against Rosin, uh, Jarzinho Rosenstruck, where he got knocked out in the first round, and Tom Aspinall, where he got submitted in the second round. And that submission was the first submission loss in his entire career, man, coming at the prime age of 42. So it goes to show, listen, Arlovsky has been around. He's done it all. He's seen it all. And when we're talking about notable wins, I can't even talk notable wins with him. I need to talk about recent notable wins to get a better picture of where we're at. And recently, Arlovsky has wins over Tanner Boser, Felipe Lins, Ben Rothwell and Chase Sherman, all decision victories. So that's very telling right there. When we're talking about Carlos Felipe, his notable wins in total, Justin Taffa, Jorgen DeCastro, Jake Collier. I think uh, Jorgen DeCastro is actually no longer in the UFC. He is the champion of a regional scene right now, which goes to show just how good UFC fighters are. And uh, Justin Taffa hasn't had the, the you know best luck in the UFC so far. Jake Collier, come on, man. This is a heavyweight turned middleweight or a middleweight turned heavyweight or something like that, man. So listen, let's just say Andre Arlovsky, intangible experience as always. However, Carlos Felipe, AJ, one thing that he has made very, very clear in the pre-fight pressers, he says, I don't give a damn about the gatekeeper known as Arlovsky. I'm going to show the man absolutely no respect. And in his fight style, I mean, he's not a very respectful man. This dude brings it. So who do you like in terms of the contrast on the feet here? Andre Arlovsky is primarily a boxer these days. And Carlos Felipe, he's not the most technical guy, but he's throwing loopy shots that will knock your goddamn block off, man. Who do you like here? Yeah, this was actually, I um, I agree with the odds on this one because this one is a lot harder to call for me than just oh, yeah. black and white. This is who I'm, this is who I'm going for. This is who I like. Um I like Felipe Felipe on the on the feet so far as the fact that he's talking shit. Yeah. He's saying he gets caught with a What's he gets up, caught bro? with a shot. He's like, bro, come on, yeah. what? Well, I'm here. <laughs> He'll let you know, man. He's there to scrap. I love that about him. And Andre Alaski, though, man, I can't count out the old dog. I did it. I forgot which fight I did it for. It might have been the Tanner Bowser. It might have been the Felipe Lins fight. Uh, I forgot which one I picked against him, but. 
don't count this man out. This homeboy is a dog. The pit bull, man, he's for real. And the what shows, you pointed out a little bit, Derek, you need to finish him to get the dub. Yep. The only way he's losing is by KO. If it's other than that, and he's staying in the pocket and staying in your face, he will keep just outperforming you, outstriking you, and really good, a good look to the judges, man. He can stay solid on the feet. It's it's hard to say which one I like a little bit more because they're both very good fighters. Andre Olavsky is a little bit more technical of sorts. He's still not the most technical fighter, but Felipe Linz, or excuse me, uh, Carlos Felipe, he'll just throw those crazy winging shots, and he has a power, but I like him specifically because he's in your face talking shit on that Absolutely. one. Who do you like, Derek? Well, that's the thing here. I, I, I think that Andre Arlovsky has more of a technical edge here, right? He's a boxer. He, make, he mixes it up to the body and to the head very well, works off the feints. He has these dangerous blitzing attacks, which is kind of funny because it's like, dang, you're 42 and you're still pulling out the blitzing attacks. It's very similar to Maheta, man, Tiago Santos, what he used to do back in the day. But that's where he finds a lot of his success here is he closes the distance very quickly with a bunch of straight punches. Carlos Felipe, I mean, what do we see? What do we say all the time, man? The, the fastest way to get to point A to point B is in a straight line. Carlos Felipe is not a straight line he is overhand to the death right there man he's coming all the way across all the way and over man like it's interesting but them loopy shots man are effective as well man and when he lands them i mean it inflicts a lot of damage here However, AJ, um, Andre Arlovsky, the big thing that made him so good to me, you know, back in the day is that he had that wrestling ability and he was able to control the fight and see where he wanted to go. He has not registered a takedown since September 15th of 2018, AJ. That was a long, long time ago, man. And I believe that was against Shamil Abdurakimov. So that's just like, come on, man. If you're talking about Felipe or uh, Carlos Felipe, excuse me. When he goes, he goes, man. And that's what I love about it, the commitment to his effort. Like, he, there's no half-assing with the man. He's like, all right, I'm here. I'm ready to scrap. He does have decent, deceptive head movement and evasiveness, too, man. A little more than Andre Arlovsky. So for those reasons, AJ, and the fast hands of Felipe, for those reasons, I'm edging out on uh, Carlos Felipe, man, on the stand-up here. I like him overall in this matchup. I do agree with the odds a little bit. Um, however, I'm not going to lie. I think out of respect to Andre Arlovsky, maybe he should be a slight favorite with the experience here. You got to give that to the man. Um, when we're talking about significant strikes landed per minute, very similar. I mean, five for uh, Felipe, about four for Arlovsky, 44% for Arlovsky, 46% for Felipe. No, um, really, we're not going to the ground on this one, man. Four and one in his last five is Felipe. Three and two for uh, Andre Arlovsky. This is what it comes down to, AJ. The winner of this fight, man, gets a little bit of that, bo that bu bump, the boost up into the rankings a little bit. For Andre Arlovsky, the pressure is on him every single fight because if he racks up a couple losses back to back, that's it. You're done. You know what I'm saying? Felipe, he's saying, if I get the win over Arlovsky, look at what that does for my career. I mean, look at what that did for a Tom Aspinall. Even though, for whatever reason, he's not getting the same type of promotion and hype that uh, that our boy Chris Dawkins is, for whatever reason, they're both just as good, in my opinion. Um, but he's not getting that bump up, but a win over Arlovsky could spell uh, real issues or you know what i'm saying felipe could be in that mix in that top 15 of like okay man now we got these young guns who are really ready to uh contend for something so the big thing here aj is the age 42 years old is arlovsky 26 is carlos felipe with all of those stats all the numbers aside who you got for this one and why yeah, man, I, I really like Felipe as a fighter on this one. Good head movement, super fast hands, and crazy cardio for a big dude that's oh, talking yeah. shit to you the whole time. <laughs> I like him, but honestly, man, I'm going with the Wiley veteran, man. I'm going right. with Arlovsky on this one. I'm going Arlovsky by decision. I think he's going to continue that route where he, you need to be able to finish him to get the dub, and I don't necessarily know if Felipe is... is uh, he's fast enough and he's good enough to get the finish. I just don't think it's going to happen in this fight against Arlovsky, man. I'm going by decision. Who you got and why? I just look at it like this, man. If you're Carlos Felipe and six of your 11 wins have come via knockout, no submissions, the other five are via decision, right? You have not registered a knockout in the UFC yet. Now is the time to do it. Now is the time to really showcase your skill and show why you are not just at the lower level of the prospects coming up in the heavyweight division. Heavyweight division needs stars right now. The heavyweight division needs exciting fighters who are really willing to put it on. Like a Jarzino Rosenstruck, man. He's had a couple of tough losses recently, man. But if you think about it, he made his mark coming up just knocking people senseless right so if felipe could do that against arlovsky man i honestly think that the star power is going to come he's funny he's charismatic he got the blonde hair man he's a big boy who throws bombs like come on everything is like setting itself up for carlos felipe to have success come on you know what he screams after the thought 
boy, boy, what's up? You know, come on, man. So I'm rocking with Carlos, boy, Felipe, man. I think that he has the chops to get it done. I would love to see a knockout, but if not a knockout, I do think that this fight goes to a decision and he'll be able to edge it out, whether it's a split decision or unanimous. It's going to be close, but I do think that uh, Carlos Felipe has the edge here. So I'm going to say knockout, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was a very close decision as well, AJ. All right, that's the co-main event, man. And this is another five fight main card, man. Interesting. Sometimes I like it just because six fight main cards are just, they drag on just a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Like throw that extra one on the prelim or whatever but main event time aj okay aspen lad she is recanting or not recanting she is repenting for the the, the sins that she has caused right here missing the bantamweight limit against macy chasson a rivalry that i don't think we will ever see at this point aj but i would still love to see that fight take place um aspen lad man she's a minus 150 favorite against the plus 125 comeback and norma dumont and i have a couple questions off the bat because i uh don't know if i agree with the the odds here aj i think norma dumont right she is clearly a featherweight like clearly she has the frame for the featherweight division sometimes um i think she's had trouble making weight at 135 but i think she's also had trouble making weight at 145 i'm not sure the question here aj is aspen lad has two weeks given her enough time to build the true frame of a 145er you know yeah she was having trouble missing weight at 135 or trouble making weight at 135 but like come on man making weight being like oh yeah i'm 145 in the cage is not what Norma Dumont is going to be. You know, she's going to be bigger. So that's the first question. The second question to, to you, or to, yeah, to you, AJ, here is that why is Aspen Ladd being rewarded in the eyes of the odds makers in a division she's never fought in, in the UFC, um, being that she's had a little bit of a layoff since her last fight and, you know, with the weight issues, man. So why are the odds makers favoring her and has she had enough time to build herself up as a true 145er? Yeah, uh, to answer the second question first, I don't know if you caught the look that I gave right off the jump because I don't look at the odds before the show yeah. starts. I like to see them now to kind of kind of just know what I'm getting into. Uh, a minus favorite for 150 on Aspen Lad. I'm not sure why they're rewarding it with that. I don't I don't see it, man. It's just especially with all the weight issues and and even her gra her style of fight. It's going to be a very hard fought against Norma Dumont going yeah. forward. I'm not really sure what's going on in that one. Again, it might be one of those things that they know that we don't, that they're able to see in Vegas that we're not necessarily seeing out there in, uh, in, you know, the, um, in the tape, yeah. but to answer the first question, I think it's a, the better of the shot that Aspen Ladd has right now to be able to build up. Cause Norma Dumont, was you know she was having the weight issues at 135 she's another fighter who went from 135 up to 145 because she's missing weight exactly how aspen lad is going but they've been working on her at the pi to kind of build her a little bit back down to get norma dumont back to 135 nice slowly healthy like you're supposed to do it but that means that the stature is going to be nice it's going to be pretty relevant both around the same size okay, yeah. i think they're both five oh uh yeah about five six five seven what uh norma dumont has a little bit of the reach advantage has espen lad had enough time to put like the significant weight on though i don't know that's yeah. it's gonna be hard to say because two weeks like how much weight can you actually do we haven't even seen john jones you know him him saying i'm gonna put on a little bit of extra weight 20 40 pounds whatever it is and he's been out for over a year i forget exactly how long it is but two weeks is a tall task to get a significant amount of good weight on yeah. Sure, you could put, you know, calories in, start bulking up, and you might get five, 10 pounds, which will make her at about the, you know, about the limit or about the same, you know, significant weight, but it's just not the good muscle weight, not the good contractile tissue that you actually need to make a difference in the octagon. So it's going to be interesting, but I think the stature as far as both of them missing 135 and jumping up makes it a little bit easier for Aspen Ladd going forward. That is interesting because it now it makes me kind of look at it as maybe this is like a bantamweight matchup taking place at featherweight. You know what I mean? Because sometimes we get, we get those. I think we got a lot of those um, in the men's bantamweight division where they just jumped up a division and said, fuck it, I guess I'll, we'll have to fight at 145. That's fine. We're both 135ers, but whatever. Um, listen, man, Norma Dumont, 31 years old, right? So she also has a little more of that. She's grown into her body more than Aspen Ladd has currently at a prime age of 26 years old. However, when we're talking about methods of victory, AJ, a little different here. Aspen Ladd, six of her nine wins are via knockout. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on. Seven of those wins are via stoppage. When we're talking about Norma Dumont, four decisions, two submissions. I mean, it's just different, right? Norma Dumont isn't that same finisher that Aspen Ladd is. And that's why I think the odds makers might view it um, as Aspen Ladd being the favorite in here. However, Norma Dumont is mean, dude. If you look at who she has fought, man, since entering the, the UFC, she's, uh, she got knocked senseless 
against Megan Anderson, right? But Megan Anderson is a, such a frame mismatch for anybody in that division. Um, she got a big win over Ashley Evan Smith, who is no longer with the promotion, but Ashley Evan Smith is a tough, tough fighter. And then she uh, won a very close split decision against Valicia Spencer. And that's what I wanted to talk about here, AJ. The path to victory for Aspen Ladd is probably what Felicia Spencer wanted to do against Norma Dumont, which is what she succeeded in in the third round. She couldn't do it in rounds one and two, which is what lost her the fight. But in the third round, Felicia Spencer, she laid on Norma Dumont, ground and pound, top control. That's Aspen Ladd's game through and through. So I wanted to ask you that question. Seeing that Felicia Spencer, even though she's a big 145er, man, I mean, come on, Felicia Spencer fought Amanda Nunez and Cyborg and didn't get knocked out by either of them, hung in there tough. So, I mean, she's a very tough fighter. Don't get me wrong. But do you think that that's the, that's the blueprint right there? I mean, if Felicia Spencer could do it for a round and really put it on her, do you think Aspen Ladd can do the same thing? I, I do think that's the blueprint, 100%. Yeah. That's the blueprint, especially that's what Aspen Ladd likes doing, put yeah. pressuring you up against the cage and then getting the uh, you know the takedown, however it comes. We really saw it against Yana Kunetskaya mm -hmm. that she was able to – that was her game plan, but Yana was just a little bit too big, so she started reversing the plan yeah. until Aspen Ladd shot that power double and was able to get it down. I, I don't remember if it was a power double or a single leg, but either way, she went back to her technical ground game and was able to get the, uh, the finish on that one. But the hard part about Norma Dumont – she circles out so nicely, man. Literally, the second she crosses that black line that lets her know she's got like a foot or two to the cage, just circles, just mm -hmm. stays on her bike, circles out, gets back, back to the center of the cage, and she'll start piecing you up. I really like Norma Dumont for the fact that she has very fast hands, great head, great footwork, great head movement, yeah. and then she'll talk shit. She yeah. literally say like, no, she even at uh in her last fight against Felicia Spencer, she got back against Cage, circled out and goes, no, 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 yeah. we're fighting right here. Like we're yeah. getting, we're swinging hands. I love that about Norman Dumont, man. It's going to be interesting. And I don't know if Aspen Ladd is going to have the size to be able to hold Felicia Spencer down or at least get her against pressure up against Cage and then hold her there. Because we saw Yana, Yana Kuniskaya just be able to literally get the underhooks, turn Aspen Ladd. And she had her back against Cage then now. What do you well, think? Well, that's one of the interesting things there, man. It's because for Yana Kuniskaya, she's originally a 145er who moved down to 135, right? But being that Aspen Ladd was able to figure out a way to get victory there does give me good signs that it's it's possible here. I mean, she knows what she's getting into. It's not like she's like, oh, shoot, I guess I'm going to have to fight this big person. I never saw it coming. Like, she probably knew that a move to 145 was in her inevitable future. Um, but let's talk about Norma Dumont just a little bit more, man. I think she's a really, she's a, I, I wrote it down like this, she's a patiently aggressive counter striker so she'll be patient but the moment that like felicia spencer was doing those crazy like kind of taekwondo karate style sidekicks right and the moment that she would lift that leg up like that and leave herself out of position then norman dumont would you know storm on her however the one thing with norman dumont that i see far too often is when she opens up for the counters and she goes first she goes big combos right hands drop it's not like she's throwing from here hands drop down here and then big hooks and she got caught man a couple times flush on the chin right aspen lad i'm not saying that her stand-up is incredible because i honestly think that her stand-up is, is still a little sloppy um you know what i mean but she has power both of these fighters have power so it's going to be interesting to see how the power translates um aspen lad she lands 55 percent of her significant strikes about five significant strikes landed per, uh, per minute and uh takedown average that's what's important here takedown average for both of them is about the same two almost three 67 percent for dumont 75 percent for aspen lad 66 percent takedown defense for lad 100 percent takedown defense for norman dumont which is like i said man it'll be interesting to see even though it's like it's, you know felicia spencer got her on the ground and she controlled her but then again her takedown defense is 100 percent. so it's interesting how it works sometimes it's these weird scrambles you get reversed whatever doesn't count as a takedown either way when aspen lad let's just ask this this ultimate big picture question when aspen lad gets on top of Nor norma dumont do you think norma dumont is able to withstand the storm it's hard because, man, Aspen Ladd's a little Tasmanian devil down Absolutely. there. She'll literally just start flirting on you and just throwing, ah, ah, mm -hmm. ah, just yeah. like a mad woman. Uh, I do think so, though. I think Norma Dumont has a little bit more of that size, and she's been a little bit more able to get used to that size, whereas mm -hmm. Aspen Ladd's kind of going to be out of her element a little bit right there. So I do think that Norma Dumont has the power to get it done. Um, yeah. What do you think? 
I don't know. I, that's what we're going to find out. Time will only tell on that one. I think Aspen Ladd is going to have the tenacity to be able to get it done because once she starts going, she doesn't stop. She's interesting with the ground and pound where it's not like it's just the composed, oh, I'm going to pick my shot. She's like, no, I'm just spazzing on you. I'm smashing you. And that's a good thing because sometimes that's what you need to do for the referee to be like, oh shit, work, work, work. You got to do something. Oh, all right, I'm going to call it. You know what I mean? So if Aspen Ladd can keep Norma Dumont on her back, I think that's her best path to victory because her best path to victory, excuse me, because Norma Dumont is pretty good on the feet. Like I said, her counter striking is very legitimate um but she's not great in the clinch which is going to be interesting because aspen lad isn't very great in the clinch either so it's like who's going to win that battle right there um and the big thing norman dumont is just a mean fighter man just like myra bueno silva she's a mean fighter who is looking for violence right and she has nice like her her legs are huge you know what i'm saying she has tree trunk legs right so she's going to have that power maybe it's going to be make it a little harder for aspen lad to get that blast double or even a single leg on her ultimately aj do you see true value in that plus 125 line for Norma Dumont? I do, Derek. Mm -hmm. I do. I see a lot of value, man. And I'll give you my pick now. I'm going Dumont by decision. I just don't think Lad's going to be big enough to get it done. And we're going to be able to see if this is Aspen Lad's new weight class. She's been having the weight issues. I think Norma Dumont's going to get it done in this one by decision, man. She's. I'm glad you noted the thing about her, her hands starting low because she starts off very technically sound. Her combos are crisp, and then they start dropping. And she'll see punches coming in, and she'll start reaching for punches, reaching to block stuff out. And like we were saying before, man, you can get caught. Once you once you take that those hands away from that chin, yeah. you start getting caught with the hooks coming around them. And I think that's where Aspen Ladd might find the best success going forward. For me, personally, I see a lot of value in that 125 underdog. I'm going Dumont by decision. What about you? Who you got? Why? Well, AJ, I just want to remind you about what you had said just a few minutes ago about the Yana Kuniskaya when she got down on the ground, right? That didn't come from a, a single leg or a blast double. You want to know what it came from? Sometimes they say, AJ, the best takedown in the game is a nice left hook, and that's what it came from. Aspen Ladd's left hook is something to watch out for, man, and I think that uh, Dumont's hands keep dropping and she's able to land the big left hook. That's the only takedown you need right there, you know what I'm saying? So I'm going to go with Aspen Ladd here, not only because I believe in the prospect of Aspen Ladd, she is an absolute killer, but also she has so much pressure on her, man. This is the time to shine. If you lose your featherweight debut, you came in, you're supposed to be, she was number three in the women's bantamweight division arguably on the cusp of a title shot if you come in and lose to norma dumont i mean what are we talking about here that's just going to be a, a not a good look all to, the eyes say it all right the eyes don't the eyes never lie chico you know what i'm saying that's not going to be a good look so aspen lad i'm counting on her because similar to ludovic klein her resume speaks for itself man we cannot look at one loss or one bad uh, weight miss and say oh we got to throw out the whole entire product right don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. i'm rocking with aspen lad here nine and one in mma she is a storm to be reckoned with and she has notable wins over yana kuniskaya two wins over sajari eubanks and a win over lena landsberg the Sajari Eubanks and the Yana Kuniskaya wins are what make me think that Aspen Ladd gets this uh, gets this victory via decision right here or a TKO. We'll see. But I'm going decision for Aspen Ladd. Five-round war. We're going to go back-to-back -back women main events that are going to go to a decision because, face it, um, that is generally speaking how the women contests end up going, man. It's not like you're seeing two heavyweights in there smashing each other in the face. But that's the pick, man. So just to recap, AJ, I want to make sure that I got this right. So we're going to go over all five real quick just to make sure that we know who's picking with who so for the jordan wright and the uh julian marquez fight we're both going jordan wright on that one man manon Firo, myra buena silva looks like we're both Firo on that one jim miller versus eric gonzalez both miller right so like we're, we're, we're pretty pretty chalky on these ones so far andre arlovsky versus carlos felipe i'm going felipe you're going arlovsky i'm going the young up-and-comer you're going the gatekeeper right on and then finally, Ladd versus Dumont. You're rocking with Dumont, and I'm rocking with Aspen Ladd here, AJ. So it's going to be interesting to see who gets the job done at the end of the day, man. And uh, at this point, folks, I think we've given you our picks or who we are leaning with for every single bout on the card. So listen, man, you know where to go when you need to get the betting advice. You need to, you know where to go when you need an assessment of the lines at hand. And you know where to go when you want to get to green. You dig. You know what time it is. Bloodywaterpodcast.com. Subscribe on YouTube at Bloody Water Podcast, Or just type us in or Free Thinkers Club. Either way, you'll get to the show. All right, AJ, one last piece of business to handle. Fight of the night, brother. So many to pick from. We have 11 fights uh, on this card, man. There's a lot of really good ones. Who is your pick for fight of the night for UFC Vegas 40? There's a lot of really good ones, and I'm going the first fight of the night on the main card, man. I'm going Julian Marquez versus Jordan Wright. I think it's going to be a banger. These dudes are big in the weight class, and they're very fast, very 
A lot of KOs can happen, a lot of decisions. We might see some very technical striking right there. We might even see a slick submission by Julian Marquez. Who knows? But that's where I'm going for the fight of the night, man. What about you? Well, I'll say that's going to be a fun one, man. And if it if it is indeed fight of the night, we're either getting a really late round, you know, third round finish or it's decision. I don't envision either of those things happening. So uh, we'll see what happens on that one. I'm going the fight before that, man. The free, the featured prelim, excuse me, Andrew Sanchez versus Bruno Silva, AJ. And the reason why this is going to be my fight of the night pick is because I see this being the bout that it can go the most back and forth. I can see Bruno Silva winning and then Andrew Sanchez storming back and then Bruno Silva coming back and it can go the ebb of flow until eventually we see a knockout, a decision whatever we saw in bruno silva's last fight all it takes is just a couple hammer fists and you're done that's all it takes man and the dude got jujitsu chops too so it's going to be dangerous either way andrew sanchez very very experienced man you cannot take that away and uh, like i said folks if you want some wagering advice i like the minus 130 line on bruno silva for that fight but through and through aj that is the fight of the night brother so uh listen man another week in the books episode number 87 i can't believe it it's already here oh my god it's a beautiful thing to see folks we say it every time uh you know please just keep rocking with us comment all the good stuff keep interacting and we'll keep showing love back i know folks that these last couple of bouts have been a little lackluster for the ufc and what i mean by that is you're not getting the conor mcgregor's you know the amanda nunez is all the biggest title fights and all that but that stuff is coming up soon man i do think we're gonna get some more uh top heavy popular you know name brand cards here in the upcoming future but don't forget about the bellator 268 card we talked about in the beginning vadim nemkov versus julius and Anglic- and sorry i keep butchering the man's name benson henderson come on all these fun fights to watch man just just know folks aj and i hope you agree with me here this is, mma is not just about ufc and bellator man you have so many different promotions man we talked about rise and you can go and watch the eagle promotion habib's promotion you know you can go sit there and and watch the lfas you can watch the all the million other regional promotions because there's so many good fighters out there are there any promotions in particular that you like to watch outside of the ufc and bellator aj man there's that wlf that's coming out of china Uh they're really good man they're really good out there as well as go check out like Derek said man there's a lot there's millions of them to watch all around you go check out your local regional scene man there's some serious killers out there especially here in texas there's some bangers man i I don't remember any of them off the top of my name but if i had to choose one like i said it's that wlf coming out of china those dudes are killers out there what about you who do you like to watch well i'll say aj you are in arguably the greatest state for regional mixed martial arts in the united states of america fury promotion is one of the best ones there in texas man so check that one out you know all that good stuff you got the aka the uh uh, american American Combat Alliance out there of Louisiana, you know, that's a fun one too. Um, but I'll be honest with you, my man. I watch so many of these different promotions. It's kind of hard to tell just off the top of my head right now. One of the one of the best ones though, I will say, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. LFA is one of my favorite promo- promotions to watch because it is the breeding ground for the UFC stars. You know what I'm saying? So you'll see that one. Um, that's terrible, right? Because I watch so many of them. I'm like, I'm trickling down this entire list and it's hard to recall anything off the top of my head. But that's just a good one. Fury promotion right there man that's a good texas-based promotion that you're gonna see a lot of really good killers coming out of and uh lfas man come on let's just talk about it folks i know there's so many more so if i missed you sorry i'll get you next time we should always show love to the regional and the big names over here but that's neither here nor there aj do you got any last words for the people before we get out of here so man yeah do us the support help us yeah. out hit us up on the website man we made it so easy literally right there just go subscribe That's we it. love the support and what i've been noticing along too man there's a lot of videos that'll catch up a couple months a couple weeks later <laughs> yeah. whenever the fighter has their next fight yeah. so drop us a comment man i'm always liking them I'm, I'm talking back hit us back up there we appreciate all the love and man we'll catch you on the next one and there's a couple uh there's a pay-per-view coming up with some absolute heat on it yes sir so stay tuned folks there's yes, some sir. great ones coming up sounds good man so listen folks drop a like subscribe for the millionth time i'm gonna keep saying it until you keep doing it but uh, that's it for us mondays and fridays at 8 a.m noon for the short clips on mondays and on fridays audio always drops a day early so just know it's monday go check it out on sunday check out apple, apple podcast or spotify our audio will be up all right folks that is it until next time peace Thank you.